and it is six o'clock. That's pretty exciting. So we can call this meeting to order. Are there any, um, we have our attendance. Uh, I assume Amy has them all. And then um, are there any changes to, oh no, now we're gonna start freezing. <laughs> uh, are there any changes to the agenda? I apologize. <laughs> uh, also, I, I'm going to note that maybe Amy hasn't logged back on yet. I'm not finding her. Oh, there she is. Okay. Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah I know. This is just crazy. My machine is not working anymore. I can't even get off the video. It's stuck. Oh, well, <clears throat> wish I could at least get rid of the picture. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. It is what it is. <laughs> okay. What uh, next on the agenda is we need to open the public hearing for the FY24 UPWP and budget. I will move that we open the public hearing for the fiscal year 24 UPWP and budget. Second. Second. Andy, thank you. Now, do we have any members of the public here who wish to speak? Could someone speak so I could test my headphones? Well, I'm trying. <laughs> and, and can we f vote to open that uh, meeting? Yeah, we need to Not open working. it. <laughs> Nothing's working. Oh, no. That's terrible. Yes, we should. Um, Charlie, uh, talk vote. again. All right. So. Charlie, can you, t can you speak again? We can hear you, Jackie. Well, we can't. I just I just sent her a little note letting her know that <sighs> other than speaking, uh, I'm going to mute Jackie. <laughs> yep. Great. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> All right. All those in favor of opening the public hearing for the FY24 UPWP and budget, uh, raise your hand or whatever works. <laughs> Uh, it, it looks like we, that motion passes. Um, so now the, um, the this is the opportunity for any member of the public who is here to speak about the budget or the UPWP uh, work program. Um, do we have anybody right now with a hand raised or anything? I don't see anything on my computer. Um, oh, unable to start the video, that's interesting. So we're going to, not going to be. I'm not going to be on the picture tonight. It says. Yeah, I'm sorry, Catherine. I shut off your videos to, so uh, so we wouldn't lose you. That was good because it's yeah. I think that's very good because it's been whether it's the uh, weather um, we don't know. It's so, good. Madam Chair. I think we're going to leave the public hearing open for the UPWP till later, and yes. I'm going to make a motion then to open the public hearing for the 2023 Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Boy, you're just right on top of it. While well, we, the rest of it are playing with, you know, trying to <laughs> organize the Zoom. Uh, do we have a second for that? I'll, I'll second it. Okay. Were you able? Uh, so, did Amy or who's a, uh, able to get that for the motion? So, uh, we're going to leave that open, uh, but we uh, we're going to vote on it. Um, so, raise your hands since we have a motion and a second. Um, it looks like everybody votes to have the open public hearing. Uh, is there anyone here to speak uh, who wishes to speak on the Metropolitan Transportation Plan? Uh, please signify with the little icon. I don't see anything. So I think what we'll do is we'll get, again, we'll leave this open. Uh, until later in the uh, uh, meeting, so anybody who has the opportunity to speak uh, has, will be able to do so. Next is the typical, um, if anybody from the public is here to make comments for items that are not on the agenda, do we have any such person here tonight to do so? Please do the little icon, can you have anybody? Can I ask you yeah. a quick question? Ben, did you second the motion for the Metropolitan Transportation Plan opening? I believe there was somebody else seconding it. I'd be glad to, but I was just voting in favor. I understood that there was a further. Yeah. Who seconded that? Andy? I did. But it, I did there might have been somebody matter. else, too. Okay. Oh, whatever. Michael? Michael. Okay. Mike Bissonette did it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. 
All right, <clears throat> we are not, um, since we do not have um, anyone to speak for items that are not on the agenda, we can move on to uh, number five of the uh, deliberative agenda and it is to approve the consent agenda, but we do not have any of those tonight. So we will move on to approving the minutes of the April 19th, 2023 board meeting. I'll move approval of uh, the minutes with uh, any edits noted. Uh, is there a second? Ah, Garrett, I see Garrett waving his hand. Excellent. All right. Um, are there any um, corrections to be noted on the uh, minutes? Please raise your hand. Uh, I think Ben. Yeah, uh, just a minor one on uh, uh, page two. It's the, uh, I believe it's the first bullet, second line. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, the first bullet. Yeah, at the uh, uh, next, I think third to last word, it should be, I believe, board, B-O-A-R-D, as opposed to B-O-R-D. Um, just wanted to show you, I am paying attention and I appreciate all your hard work going into constructing the minutes that somebody ought to read them all the way through. So do you have, do you have a line number for that, Benjamin? Yeah, uh, it's the, uh, I can tell you one second. So, it's line 11, by the way. Oh, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. 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 Got it. Thank you. Excellent. Are there any other corrections to be noted? Comments? No. Okay. Uh, then we shall vote to, to pass the minutes and with corrections as noted. Because that was the only one I had and I thought I'd see if somebody else got it. <laughs> so raise your hands to uh, uh, adopt those minutes with corrections as noted. All right. Thank you so much. That's terrific. Next on the um, moving right. I, I think we've lost the audio on Catherine and I'll uh, yeah. jump in and ask uh, for staff introductions. Uh, this month we have Anne. Oh, there you are, Catherine. Uh, we can okay. hear you again. Go right ahead. Catherine? <laughs> oh, yeah. no. You, this you, is you, you dropped out for a bit. We were about to introduce Anne and Melanie, but please finish. <laughs> That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I I really apologize. This is, you know, it's tough to be a chair when things just seem to disappear on you. But anyway, who wishes to go first, Anne or Melanie? Oh, no. Am I going again? No, we're here. I guess I can mm. go first. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everybody. I'm Melanie Needle. I'm a senior planner. Um, I have been at CCRPC since... 2004. Um, <clears throat> I am, I guess my responsibility is our split between GIS and um, land use. Um, I work specifically on energy planning and um, I guess that's been taking up a lot of my time lately with updating the ECOS plan um, I also update the ECOS indicators on our scorecard and help to prepare our ECOS annual report that we do annually, um, respond to municipal um, technical assistance requests for mapping. Um, this year, we've gotten a new piece of software called ArcGIS Urban to help do um, build out analyses for municipalities to understand their development pattern. So I've been spending some time on that, learning that software. We have a project with um, Essex Town um, under the Municipal Bylaw Modernization Grant. Um, also working on with Anne um, on the South Burlington Climate Action Plan Transportation Implementation Component. Um, so that's a little bit about the work that I do here at CCRPC, mostly, um, you know, focused on the work that I'm doing this year. 
Um, I have, I live in Burlington. I have two kids, age 15 and 11, and two dogs. Um, I enjoy skiing and running. And uh, let's see, I think that that's, I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, that, that's about it for the brief introduction. Happy to answer any questions. I see Chris, you have your hand raised. Oh, thank you. Yes, I, I need to know the dog's uh, ages. If you go 15 and 11 <laughs> for the children, I, I need to have the follow-up right there in parallel with the dogs. I, po I apologize. Probably older, right? <laughs> uh, the dogs one dog pets. is six, and he is a white golden doodle. And the other dog is three, and she is a gray golden doodle who is the daughter of the older dog. We bred them, well, we bred the older dog twice. Um, and that was an experience. And um, he is no longer able to have children. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Thank I had two other follow-ups that uh, sure. I'm, I'm gonna drill down a little bit more because uh, in South Burlington, I'm ashamed to admit the number of vehicles in my driveway can add up uh, to three or four uh, due to the five adults in the household. How many vehicles do you operate uh, and whereabouts in Burlington? Are you north end, south end, somewhere in between? Just curious, um, when you're working with South Burlington's transportation and climate action folks, this probably comes up. So we have a uh, very elderly um, internal combustion vehicle that we are keeping going. And we also have a Nissan Leaf, I've been an electric vehicle driver for the last 10 years and actually just yesterday installed charging equipment at my house. Um, so we have two cars for a family of four. Um, and I live um, off of East Ave, um, like across the street from the hospital. Great. Thank you. Uh, that's a great vision. I'm sure that that's something you're addressing. Is there a quick snapshot of what South Burlington is doing with their transportation thing, an item that they are focused on that you could share with us? Sure. So in um, October, the city council um, approved the climate action plan that um, we consulted on with the South Burlington Energy Task Force. When I say we, I mean me and Anne Janda, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Um, and we um, established greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, they're, they're pretty ambitious for the transportation and building sector. And so the project that we're working on now with South Burlington and VHB as the consultant is um, what are the implementation steps for transitioning the um, you know, vehicles to electric vehicles, the target is 75% of the fleet being either all electric or partial electric by 2030, reducing vehicle miles traveled um, by two and a half percent and focusing up development um, in a high density compact manner. And then also, you know, um, encouraging more walking and biking to reduce that vehicle miles traveled. So VHB is doing the work in coming up with the policies that South Burlington would need to implement or the education that they would have to do to realize those very ambitious climate action plan targets in the transportation sector. Thank you. And then the last question, I don't want to hog everybody's time, but uh, we had put solar fields both on our capped landfill and in the southeast quadrant, we had uh, two uh, placements of solar farms by uh, private developers. Uh, the school district, I think, reaps the benefits of the capped landfill one. We have one at the uh, Veterans Memorial Park, Dorset Park, uh, by the hockey rinks as well. And then specifically in the Southeast Quadrant, we were looking for reuse because these farms are set for 20 years, maybe 30 years. And so where we see houses springing up with panels on their roofs, one can imagine that the need for farms may lessen over time. And I know it's been a grapple with our land use planning in the 
entire county to try and find places where solar farms would be acceptable. Uh, I just wonder if you've stumbled over reuse of these farms yet, or if you've seen any planning for that yet, and then also whether wind is making any effort whatsoever in the county. So, so reuse is your question more about reuse of the panels once they have expired and gone through their no, useful no, the life, actually, or the foot, more the footprint of, use? the footprint of the land. We were specifically interested in South Burlington at reclaiming it. We're having an option for the city to obtain it uh, to regenerate the green field uh, that we envisioned it to be. So uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, I, as I say, it's been tough to shoehorn these farms in into areas that the cities and towns want to have uh, because not everybody wants you know the reflections of a solar farm in their backyard, uh, and so. We are getting to the point where 20 years from now, we can envision that these fields may not be as necessary as they were before because they'll shrink in size or uh, the paneling as you will become obsolete and or people will have them more on their parking lots or houses or commercial spaces. So uh, and the other aspect was, are we doing anything for wind beyond the ones that we seven windmills I can see from my house? Yeah, so wind is a little tricky currently because of the PUC's sound rules for wind at night um, have a very quiet decibel level and has made wind um, not a viable option in Vermont since uh, the wind rules were enacted at the state level of, a few years ago. And then, you know, regarding your question about you know, reusing the land that solar panels were on. I mean, it's a little, it's site specific and I think, you know, falls within the realm of South Burlington's land development regulations. So I think, you know, if, you know, solar is no longer there, whatever is permissible under zoning, I think, um, you know, could, could happen under, you know, for a different land use purpose. Well, thank you. I just wanted to bubble up on that. Then anyone else? I don't see anybody. I will add a comment that if we get an administration that wasn't anti-renewable resources and anti-wind, we might get a little more wind power in the state, but that's a separate topic. Yeah, and I think that once the board in a few um, months, when we start to talk with the board about the enhanced energy plan, this issue about wind will come up again. We're working with the energy subcommittee of the long range planning committee to talk about wind and, you know, are currently considering um, adding a policy, encouraging, you know, the PUZ to take another look at that wind sound rules so that we can, you know, realize our 90 by 2050 renewable energy goals in the state. So I think we could have a, a broader, com more specific, broader conversation in a little bit once um, we start getting into the enhanced energy planning work with the board. Well, thank you. Uh, that's very interesting. Any other comments or questions? If not, we'll move on to Ann Janda, who is the energy coordinator for the RPC. Uh, yeah, I'm an energy project manager, and I have been with uh, the organization since September uh, 2021, and I was brought on to assist municipalities uh, with projects related to their enhanced energy planning that um, Melanie uh, had been working on previously. Uh, we found that a lot of what would be wonderful to do in the enhanced energy um, plans involved money. And in my first year, there wasn't a lot of money flowing just yet. Um, so I got involved with Melanie in the climate action plan in South Burlington. Um, and like she said, now we're also working with an outside consultant, VHB, to work with South Burlington on implementation steps on the transportation portion of that climate action plan. So that's one piece of what I'm doing right now. Um, in my second year at CCRPC, the funding for my role changed a little bit. 
instead of coming through the um, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, um, my funding is now coming through uh, the Agency of Buildings and General Services, uh, otherwise known as BGS, uh, because I'm uh, primarily now focused on helping to implement the Municipal Energy Resilience Program in Chittenden County. And I was also uh, chosen, I guess, with two other RPC planner, energy planners to uh, assist all the other RPC energy planners um, in learning about the, we call it the MERP program. Uh, and that's been rolling out kind of slowly. BGS, uh, it, this is the first time they've ever um, put together a grant program. But the program is intended to help municipalities do upgrades on their buildings, um, like energy efficiency work, as well as potentially putting in um, new heating and cooling systems. And so we're at the beginning stages of that process, but it has been a big learning curve for everyone involved, in, including BTS. And so um, there, there has been a lot of work to do, even though it hasn't actually rolled out uh, to the municipalities yet. And then the last big thing I'm involved in is uh, the communications uh, union district that was formed in Chittenden County. I was um, helpful in sort of getting the word out about that um, to uh, communities so that the communities could vote on whether or not to join. And uh, once that um, came together, then I was um, chosen to be the clerk uh, for what we're calling the CCCUD. Uh, so that's taken up a, a good portion of my time. And we're in the process of hiring a consultant uh, to help us with an RFP process to sort of move forward and to do some project management for us. Um, I've also done a lot of work uh, since I've started with energy committees and just general you know, uh, increasing awareness uh, of all the things having to do with addressing uh, climate change. And I live in Hinesburg and I am married and have a cat um, and I like to garden and hike and I've really gotten into watercolors lately and I just signed up to uh, take a class to learn more French so that I can be cooler when I go to Montreal. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, now that I know that you're in Wonder Color, I'll put you on my list for the Town Hall Art Project. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> because, we, uh, because of the nice walls and the great lighting in the Jericho Town Hall, we've for over 11 years um, had uh, programs to um, emerge, whether they're emerging or established artists to show, depending on the theme, uh, in the Town Hall for months at a time. That way you get something to look at that's nice too. <laughs> yeah, it's, ni it's nice that's when you've great. got a space like that to get, yeah, give people the opportunity. Exactly, because it's, it's not as uh, intimidating as going to a gallery. And so they can, you know, people have actually come in to just look at the art now, so it's wonderful. Uh, any other comments or questions for uh, Anne? I don't see any little hand icons up. So I will thank Anne and appreciate all the work that she's doing, especially now that I definitely need <laughs> communication help. <laughs> um, all right. So um, moving on then, um, we have the infrastructure and national highway system reliability targets and who wishes to speak to this one? I will, I will start, sorry, I was, Somehow the sun came up, so which is wonderful, but it was in my eyes. So um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to um, just start. I'm here with Sai. Uh, we'll provide a very brief presentation on this uh, agenda uh, topic. Uh, but before that, you have a very detailed memo in your packet about the, the transportation performance management process, the measures, uh, specifically the targets that we're going to be, the measures and targets we're going to be talking tonight, as well as uh, the proposed uh, motion for you to take action on 
Um, with that, I will try to share my screen. Okay. Yeah, do you see this? Do you see the screen? Uh, do you see the presentation? Yeah, you can see it. Yep, no, oh, there it is, Baird. Excellent. And is it in a presenter mode now? Yes, it is. Uh, yes. Good now. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, I'm just going to provide, uh, together with Sai, a very brief presentation and happy to answer any questions at the very end. Um, so this is the presentation outline. We can very briefly talk about what is a transportation performance management, uh, go over the national goal areas where FHWA developed measures for, and then we, uh, we meaning the DOT and the MPOs are in charge of developing targets for. Um, talk a little bit about when it, action is needed from us on these specific different uh, measures and, and targets. And Sai is gonna specifically talk about the uh, infrastructure condition measures and targets, as well as the system reliability on the NHS with a national highway system as well as the interstate freight travel on the interstate. And then we're gonna conclude with the recommendation. So real quickly, um, in uh, you know both MOP21 and FAST Act, which was the federal act uh, thing that maybe started back in 2011, maybe 2012, uh, they put a lot of emphasis on transportation performance management approach which is basically an approach that uses data and a strategic level at the strategic level. And it's an approach to, to make sure that the investments that we make on our transportation system uh, takes us closer to meet our goals and achieve our national goals. And I'm gonna talk about the national goals in a second. Uh, there was rulemaking happening back in 2015, 16, I believe. And that rulemaking basically set the measures. So the performance measures are set uh, and the targets are what the DOTs and the MPOs are basically setting either yearly or whatever the, you know, the, uh, the schedule is for that specific measure. It also identify roles and also you know, set the target deadlines. And uh, this approach requires a lot of close coordination with DOTs, MPOs, and transit authorities. Um, and this is something new that we've been um, accomplished in the past few years. So I talk about the national goal areas. So FHWA through rulemaking established performance measures for these specific areas. The first one is safety. And I wanna remind the board that uh, we came to you back in January of 2023. And uh, you know, like uh, we had a memo that uh, looked at the performance measures and targets and you approved the statewide targets for our area. Um, and then uh, they set measures for the infrastructure condition of the national highway system. This is the condition of the pavement and the bridges on the system. Uh, it also, uh, we, um, the, the next area is basically the national highway system reliability. And we're talking about travel times on the system. Uh, it's also uh, economic development, the freight travel day time reliability only on the interstate is another, another area that there is a, a specific national goal. Um, there's also a goal uh, and measures on congestion on NHS. This uh, you know, area and these performance measures are not required in Vermont because we are in attainment at this point. So the state meets uh, the the national air quality standards, so we don't we're not required to develop uh, targets for these measures. And the environmental sustainability is another goal area, which we do not have measures yet. As a general rule, uh, the MPOs, which is us at this point, CCRPC in Vermont, has 180 days after VTrans develops their targets to either agree to accept their targets. And VTrans develops statewide targets. Uh, so the, uh, the MPO, the, the, the MPO board needs to kind of like, you know, uh, consider and agree to accept those statewide targets um, as the same targets for our metropolitan planning area, or we have the option of establishing our own targets. 
Um, I, I think, uh, Sai, this is your cue to start talking about the data and the actual targets for these measures. Sure. Thank you, Eleni. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sai Sarapali, Senior Transportation Planning Engineer at CCRPC. So I'll be talking about, um, I'll be talking actual numbers now. So as Eleni mentioned, uh, FHWA um, uh, set the uh, rule setting for the um, performance areas. And this is the uh, uh, national highways, national uh, highway system infrastructure condition, which is, uh, this is for payment. Um, so the performance measures are uh, percentage of payment on interstate in good condition at 28%. And um, and uh, the target for um, uh, payment in on interstate in poor condition is 4.9 percent, um, and uh, um, the target for uh, payment on in non interstate, which includes like uh, arterials, um, state highways, on um, uh, the the percentage is 30 percent, and um, the target for uh, payment on the non interstate. Uh, national highway system in poor condition at 9.9%. So VTRANS already established these um, targets in December and submitted to FHWA. Um, so as Eleni mentioned, we have 180 days to adopt these targets or we have to come up with uh, our own. But you know we are sticking with the state targets um, to apply for MPO. Next slide, Eleni. Thank you. So um, as of uh, August uh, 22, um, 2022, in, in Chittenden County, we have about 77 miles of interstate, out of which like 80% or in 80% uh, of the payment is in good condition, and uh, about four miles um, of interstate in poor condition. Um, and then um, we have about like 48 miles of non-interstate NHS. Um, out of which like 11.5 miles, of about 24% of payment um, is in good condition and about 7% uh, uh, in, is in poor condition. Next slide, please. Um, the next infrastructure is bridges. Um, so we have about 59 uh, bridges um, on national highway system. Um, about 52, 52.5% uh, are in good condition and there are no bridges in poor condition uh, as of uh, uh, December, 2021. Next, uh, next uh, area, next performance area is uh, uh, travel time reliability on a national highway system. So this is uh, measured by person miles traveled on interstate and the target is uh, 90%, and um, uh, person miles traveled on non-interstate uh, NHS uh, is at 80%. Um, and the next one is the freight, the truck travel time reliability. Uh, it is um, uh, measured as an index, uh, as a ratio. Um, it's like uh, the target is less than 1.75%. So next slide, please. Um, so this is a graph showing the travel time um, reliability for Chittenden County. Um, this is the data um, available from FHWA. It's like a big data set. Um, the acronym is NPMRDS, which stands for National Performance Measures Research Data Set. And um, INRIX is a data vendor. They actually take all this big data and they, they develop this nice um, like you know, user-friendly graphs and uh, um, reports. So they, are, they they perform all the data analytics uh, using all this uh, data. And this data is pretty much like you know the data coming from um, like roadside devices uh, and also uh, from vehicles and you know maybe some some cell phone data. So there's a lot of data in there. There's like big data. So this chart shows that interstate travel time reliability for Chittenden County we are in 2021 is at 100%. So it's above the target, like 90% is the target, but we have more than 90%, uh, we have like 100% reliable. Next, next slide. Um, this graph shows um, uh, travel time reliability for non-interstate NHS travel time, uh, which are, we are about like 94%, and the target is, was 80%. So we are above the target on this one. Um, and then next one is uh, this 
graph showing the truck travel time reliability um, and we are at 1.23 uh, index uh, and the target is 1.75. So we are well, like, you know, at the um, achieving targets in the in MPO area, Dunchen and County. Thank you, Sai. Yeah. Um, so before we get to this recommendation, we presented all this to the TAC uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the TAC as well as the staff recommends that the board accepts the statewide targets as established by VTrans for the NHS infrastructure and system reliability performance for our area, the metropolitan planning area. Uh, this is our recommendation. Are there any questions about uh, the measures, the targets, you know, the motion? I see Bard, Bard has his hand up, but I want to take, I just want to ask a question first. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any kind of punishment for not meeting your targets? Because, you know, technically the mileage for poor on the interstate is slightly above the federal maximum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there are some. Uh, and, and they are different for different uh, kind of measures and areas. For example, for the safety measures and targets, if you do not, if VTrans does not meet their targets, then uh, they need to use all their safety funds for safety projects or safety, uh, you know, specific initiatives. Um, I believe VTrans has been doing that anyway, but other states haven't. So if they don't meet their targets, yes, there are some uh, uh, repercussions if you don't meet their targets and you have to refocus your programs to address the issues uh, to start meeting their targets. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank, thank you. And, um, and can, I, can I add to that, Eleni, sure. uh, about the, about the travel, travel time reliability and, uh, and also infrastructure um, the performance measures that those targets are set every four years, like full full time, like you know, full four years targets. But uh, the state devotees have to report uh, every two years, like you know, how they are doing on their system, how the system is performing, you know, uh, how their infrastructure is performing every two years. But the targets are set for four years, so so they'll have like a like a um, like a stage like in the middle of the time where they can. Um, like look at how how what things are working and how they can distribute the funding to different things so that they can uh, achieve that target in the next two years. There is a check-in kind of period. Yeah, there's a check-in kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So every two years for, for some measures, for others. So that's where kind of like there are different uh, you know timelines yeah. for different measures. So safety is annual. Yeah. Uh, these measures are you know two and four years. So um, yeah. This is no. kind of like a, a complicated uh, process here. <laughs> Thank you, Bart. Sure. Well, first I'd observe, and I don't mean this to be amusing, but if a bridge were to abruptly fail, that would probably feel like a punishment. <laughs> so I think there are some natural consequence punishments. Oh, that's true. Yes. Um, my bigger question though, and I apologize if I just have failed to grasp this in the past, I'm struck by what appears to be a binary rating system of either good or poor. And I know I've seen more nuanced rating systems. So maybe just describe or explain that briefly, why there are two. So presumably a brand new bridge would be excellent and one that's 10 years old and good is good. And mm -hmm. are they both rated good? What does that tell us? <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is the FHWA uh, procedure, how they do the ranking. So they look at the bridge uh, deck area, the surface condition, the, uh, the structure condition, and they come up with scores. And according to the FHWA procedure, they divided um, the um, scoring between good and poor. So there are so, so many bridges which might be in fair condition, like, you know, which falls in that uh, umbrella uh, between good and poor. Um, but they're, they're, they're not, they're still, I think, it's part of the FHWA process that we are looking at how many are good and how many are poor. And if there are a lot of poor bridges, then you should be working on those poor bridges. You know, yes. so like you know, how you how you how you uh, divert uh, funding to like structures which we need more attention. So this is more like for performance. It's not. I mean, yeah, one is excellent, one is good. Yeah, both are in good condition. <laughs> So you don't need any funding for those, you know, maybe maintenance funding, but not capital funding. 
I don't know. I mean, you know, that's something. That yeah, no, I think you're right, Sai. So, so Bard, I think that, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, like good and poor. Uh, we do have fair. So we have different gradations in, in when you're just basically you're looking at. But it's like when you come to performance measures, we're mm -hmm. only looking at good and poor. There are other in between. In between, yeah. Any any other questions? I comments? think Mike Mike had a right. I yeah, I can't see right? all of them. Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I was gonna ask you about um a couple of things, but it's really not that important. But I, can you explain the the um freight ratio? What's that based on? <laughs> yeah, I, I know that, that's a that's a big. I mean, it's a technical question, but I can I, I'll try to answer uh, as much as I can. So, so the freight uh, is a, it's a index is a ratio of uh, 90, 95th percentile travel time to the average travel time. It takes takes like a segments of interstate, uh, and then they also look at the uh, the timing, like you know, in the morning, afternoon and evening and then weekdays weekends and then they do like a, a weighted average so there is like a big formula for that <laughs> but this is more like yeah. a to be to be not like you know uh, to tell you like in a short form it is like a ratio of um, like 95 percentile travel time to 50th percent, like normal oh. average travel time like no it's a, it's a shorter form but there is a big formula for that oh. Okay, that that's good. That's too complicated for me to understand. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and it looks like the the MPR area is in good shape with these yeah. all of these uh, metrics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it seems that we're meeting all our targets for the uh, travel time reliability as well as the freight reliability. So that that's that's good news for us. Uh, when it comes to condition of the, you know, of the of the pavements and stuff, you can see that we are kind of falling a little bit behind, but in behind some, some, yeah, but we are pretty close to the target. So, right. yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions uh, or comments on the on, on this before uh, we, there is a motion to accept the statewide targets? Uh, please raise your little icon because I. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, are you going to speak again, Bard? No. Okay. So, all right then. I'll we'll, we'll make a motion to accept the targets. Uh, and this is an MPO vote. Just to let you know. All right. Uh, so everyone who um, I'll second that. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> all those in favor, raise your hand. I can see that. All right. Thank you very much. The motion passes. Uh, <clears throat> next is the um, on the agenda is the federal adjusted urban area boundary approval. And who will speak to this? That would be me. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Shrest, Senior Transportation Planning Engineer here at the RPC. And let me just fire up a presentation here. Would someone be so kind as to let me know that you can see this? I can. All right, I see some hands raised, waving. This is, this is lovely, thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's get going. So this is what is known as the Federal Adjusted Urban Area Boundary. It's a FHWA process that we undertake about every 10 years following the decennial census. Um, some of you may recall this 10 years ago, maybe not. Um, let me see. Okay, just uh, I want to give a brief introduction of what the terms we are talking about, and you know what this means to you, and we'll uh, take questions from there. So we start with the census urban area that comes out following the census, 
and you can see the definition I have there up on the screen. And to make things a little more complicated, FHWA has their own definition of what uh, an urban area is. And uh, the key thing to take away there is um, the threshold for an MPO designation is 50,000 people, which as you're all very much aware, we are an MPO and the only one in the state of Vermont. Following the 2020 census, we had we have two urban areas. Uh, the census, sorry, I'm I'm retraining myself. The census has revised their terms as they tend to do every time we go through this. Um, you may recall we used to talk about urbanized areas or urban clusters. Those terms are no longer; they're just urban areas, and they just have different populations. Uh, but anyway. Back on track here. Two urban areas in Chittenden County, we have the Burlington urban area and the Milton urban area. And I just included some uh, population and housing statistics there, just for you know, food for thought. And I took a look at, you know, there's, there's always been a, a lot of talk at this table of, you know, what were to happen if, um, you know, we weren't the only MPO in the state, when would that happen? And you know the closest uh, I don't really want to say competitor, but the Lebanon um, you know White River Junction and New Hampshire Vermont um, areas you know at, at thirty thousand people, so there's a bit of a ways to go there, so I don't think we have to fret too much about that right now. Um, and I'll just mention that you know if you're if you're not aware of it, MPOs don't need to stay within state boundaries. they can very much cross state borders. So that's um, what would happen in that case if they were to exceed 50,000 people. Why is this urban area um, expansion important? Uh, we use it for planning purposes. It, it more or less exists in the background. Um, after you hear this presentation tonight, you, you probably won't hear about it again for 10 years. And that's, that's okay. I think that's a uh, generally speaking, a good thing. But we use it for um, categorizing and reporting highway traffic characteristics. You know, um, urban roads versus rural roads have different uh, growth factors associated with them. So when you know, development comes along and does a traffic impact study in one of your municipalities, they will uh, typically, if it's at a large enough scale, produce a traffic impact study. And uh, part of that uh, requires them to get traffic volumes and adjust them based on whether or not they are classified as urban or rural. So it's kind of one of the more common cases that this would come into play. And there is also a little funding nuance. Um, I'll show, uh, I'll talk about the functional classification system. I know we're inundating you with systems of highways tonight. We just talked about the national highway system. I'm gonna talk to you about the functional classification system in a moment. Um, but urban minor collectors, so in the functional classification system, there is this thing called uh, minor collectors, and they can be either be urban or rural, depending on where they fall. And uh, the key takeaway there is if they are urban, they are part of what is known as the federal aid system. And if a roadway is on the federal aid system, it's uh, eligible to receive federal funding for transportation projects. And so that is the one nuance where this can sort of come into play if, you know, there's a, a minor collector and it's considered urban, it's eligible to receive federal funding. If it's rural, it's not. And so as, as part of this process, you know, you're really the goal is just to uh, smooth out the boundaries, uh, primarily just based on geographical features, preferably. Uh, but you know, we also use property lines if we need to. And it's important to note that you know these adjustments don't affect any funding that um, that ties back to population. The census boundaries would cover in that instance. And also important to note that this doesn't make any actual changes to, func to the functional classification system. Um, 
and the federal aid system itself remains the same, um, aside from whether or not it's, again, this cuts back to that nuance of the urban versus rural minor collector. That's the only, only nuance there. And I put a link in the chat to the online map that was shared. And this is just a screenshot of what it looks like. So the light pink are the census urban areas. And then the dark pink are the proposed additions uh, to create the, um, the federal urban areas. And so if a roadway falls on a border, uh, like hopefully you can see my mouse, like North Williston Road over here that falls on a border, that would be considered urban. The only other thing I want to make mention of is that, you know, as we go through this process, it's a, it's a real good time since we're looking at um, the federal aid system and functional classification in general. It, it's a good time to consider whether or not there should be any adjustments to a roadways functional class. And there were two that we wanted to look further into in the town of Essex and that those were um, Weed Road right here, which would form a border and uh, Towers Road, which would also be a border. And right now those are just local roads. They are not on the federal aid system, but uh, from a cursory look at them, we feel like they would likely meet the criteria for a minor collector. And in this instance, if you know, we were to propose that and you were to approve it and they would then be urban, they would then be on the federal aid system and eligible to receive federal funds. Okay. So Jason, quick question. Questions. Yes. Um, the away. light pink existed from the census and would have stopped where the dark pink comes in and the adjustment is in the process of being made by the state to make it all look more contiguous the way we see it uh, when we look at our maps and then to sketch the border, the roads that are on the edges uh, to be included, like you just pointed out with Tower Road, uh, that may more appropriately be seen as uh, urban. Is that correct? Correct, except for it's, it's, this is an internal thing. This was, these are, this is a staff proposal. This is not uh, coming from Featrans. These are our proposed expansions. And then how is that, gonna, you're gonna show us how that works up the line. Okay, thank you how it can get approved right from from here should you um be so inclined to you know approve these proposed boundaries that would we would then send them over to vtrans and they would work with federal highway to um, get them finalized thank you sure any other questions or comments about this Lord. You know, I'm struck. I can't picture a downside, but it seems worth calling the question. Is there any potential downside to classifying these roads as you just described? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, it came up at the TAC meeting as well. And really, no, I, I couldn't come up with one. Um, I, it's a head scratcher for sure. but. Any other questions before uh, a motion is made to uh, approve the proposed federal adjusted urban area boundary where there may be minor changes down the road? And it is an MPO vote. I hear something. If I may, I have a, a question. So Jason, just to use my town because I'm, I'm curious here, as I understand your map, um, let me put my camera on. I lie in wait here. Um, the um, um, if you go up to uh, uh, off of Shelburne Village now, and you go up not to Dorset Street but to Spear Street, 
Um, Spear Street in Shelburne, if this map is approved, would become part of the, uh, the, the, the designation for roads and would be subject to be able to get aid, correct? No, sorry, I, I didn't explain that nuance. Uh, well, yeah, so I'm trying to understand how the funding versus putting the maps in the border, because as I'm looking at your map, the if I'm reading it right, because the streets aren't labeled, is that um, Spear Street in Shelburne would now become uh, part of the federal aid system. But am I reading that wrong? So um, the federal aid system consists of, you can see my mouse, right? Um, yes. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. The federal aid system consists of all of these uh, top roadways above minor collectors. So interstate freeway, principal arterial, minor arterial, major collector. All of those are part of the federal aid system, regardless of whether or not they are urban or rural. Okay. The only time this boundary comes into play is in the instance of minor collectors so the dotted lines so urban minor collectors are on the federal aid system rural minor collectors are not so okay. in the instance of spear street it's always on the federal aid system based on its functional classification um, i think it's is it thomas road um there is a Thomas Road. I'm not sure which one, what you're trying to say. Yeah, in, in Shelburne, it, it's a min there is a minor collector here. I, I can't, I, I wanted to say it's Thomas Road, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, but there is a minor collector that we are um, proposing to include in the urban area. And so that would be on the federal aid system. If we okay, didn't- That would be a if, change. I'm looking at your map here and I, I in the area where you've got that, uh, I think that is Thomas Road. Um, okay, so that's how that would work. And, and it looks like there's a couple of others that might come into play as well, or at least one other in Shelburne. Um, Correct. Okay. All right, um, That's that helps explain to me. So the, the, the expansion there of the urban area is it only takes into account those minor collectors as far as adding them to the to the, the system. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, great question. Thanks for the opportunity to clarify that. Yep, thanks for your explanation. It was very clear. Jason? Any? Jason, can yes. I, kind of picking up on that, um, I don't know if, I, if you said it, I missed it, but how much roadway with this ad do you know Ooh, in terms of mileage perhaps yeah. or yeah yeah i don't i don't know the answer to that question in terms of like the increased amount of roadway mileage that would be now considered urban yeah i don't i don't have that answer okay that probably is something we could do a mapping exercise and calculate but i don't have it right now yeah i i, I don't know if in terms of funding and whatnot, you know, how that narrows the, the pot. It's probably not significant, right? No, no, not significant. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions uh, or comments? Uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> if, if not, uh, we need a motion to um, approve the proposed uh, federal adjusted urban area boundaries. So moved. I'll second. second. Uh, all right. Is this an MPO vote? Yes, this is an MPO vote. Thank you. Uh, so all those um, okay, in favor of um, Raise your right, raise your hand, please. There we go. Yeah, that's good. All right. The motion passes. Uh, <clears throat> so if I may, before we leave this topic, Jason, if you know, is the other um, minor collector that's in Shelburne that's going to become part of the uh, the network now, is, is, is that Mount Philo Road? It is, yeah. Um, you know, ap apologies, there was a, a comment you know, we could have included some road names on here. Um, 
if you if you have the online map and you zoom in, the road names do eventually come up. It's just we didn't want to. It would it would crowd things quite a bit if we included all of them. But it it is it is Mount Philo Road that a, a portion of it would be um, considered considered urban. Okay, thank you. No, I'm I'm familiar enough to make the the leap with my own town, but uh, obviously other towns were I'd be remiss to even guess. So, but thank you. Sure. Catherine, just a point of order. It was an MPO vote. Do we have to show what towns voted how? Uh, I think Amy uh, takes care of that because it, it, it comes out in the minutes. Yeah, we'll include a table in the minutes, Mike, as long as, as, long as nobody's voting no or there's no, not a split vote. Um, we're, but, we're yeah, that's, I, I just didn't see all the hands go up and I don't see the whole screen. So I, I didn't know if anyone was abstaining or whatever. If I held up one hand, was that one vote? And if I held up, didn't hold up the other, was that a no? I, I, I'm confused. Well, you're with South Burlington, so that's two votes. So, yeah. But I only used one hand. Still two I, votes. Yeah. Yeah. And just for those of you who are newer to the board, and when we talk about MPO voting, um, there's um, some discussion of this in our bylaws where there's some weighted voting. So Burlington gets four votes, uh, South Burlington gets two, Colchester gets two. Um, we used to kind of talk about Essex getting two, but now it's really the town gets one, the city gets one um, in Essex, and then every uh, all the other towns uh, get a vote. But um, Buell's Gore and the, uh, the other non-municipal members do not have a vote other than VTrans. VTrans, of course, gets a vote on MPO business. And that's a subject for discussion at some point. Well, especially as VTran often gets the final vote. <laughs> uh, they do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I hate to belabor this topic, but I, I, I am curious. So, Jason, um, the funding, we our funding is finite, right? So as you add these uh, minor collectors um, and the fact that they're now eligible for funding, it takes the existing pot and just stretches it more. It's not like additional funding comes in as a result of this, correct? No, additional funding doesn't come into it. I don't know if I'd say it, it stretches it further because it's all project dependent and you know where it, where it's been planned and where it's being moved forward. Oh, so it's only if there's projects that are involved, so paving as an example. So you don't actually receive any potential uh, federal funding unless you're doing something to that road. It's not like VTrans's right. formula where they give so, you know, funding every year for miles of road that you have. It's not like this is a similar kind of thing that just comes to the town. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's all very helpful. Um, before we close the uh, public hearing and adopt the FY24 UPWP and budget, uh, is there any uh, public who would come in during uh, presentation, uh, the meeting to have, make any comments? I don't see anything I on my I do not see any, so um, I, I don't believe there's anyone outside of the board in the meeting. All right, I'll move that we close the public hearing and adopt the fiscal year 24 UPWP and budget. And we have to make two votes on this because there's transportation funding involved. So the, the one, it, there's an MPO vote for it and an RPC vote for it. Second. Just, just so, so that people can So should the motion just be to close the hearing at this point since we have to have two votes? Yes. Okay. So that, that's what we took it to be. All those in favor of closing the hearing, uh, raise your hand, please. And from what I can see, it looks pretty good. Um, so now yeah. we can move on to the two votes. If there's any, unless this, unless the board has some other questions. So we need a motion to adopt to the uh, UPWP. Yes. And and then another motion to adopt the budget. Uh, they can be done together. It's just that one is an M you have to do it twice. One is MPO and one is uh, RPC. Sounds like two motions to me. Yeah, I'll move the UPWC. I'll second that. 
Thank All you, those Gary. in favor say aye. Uh, so is that is that for the is that yeah, yeah, order, is that for MPO or RPC? Yeah. Point no, of order. Yeah, it's for the RPC because Garrett made the motion. Thank you. So raise your hand. Because I could. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the motion passes. Uh, now we need to have a motion uh, to adopt the UPWP and the budget for the uh, with the MPO. I'm not moving this one. All right, I'll so move I'll, it. Dan Karen moves it. Thanks, Dan. I'll second that. All those in favor, raise your hand, please. That looks good to me. Thank you very much. The motion passes. And now I'll move to close the public hearing and adopt the 2023 Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Second. And this is an MPO vote as well. So just to be sure. All those in favor, then raise your hand. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. The motion passes. All right. Now, Mike gets to have time to speak because this is, uh, we're moving towards uh, agenda item 12, executive committee nominations. Okay, hey, thanks, Catherine. And it was in your packet, as soon as I find it here, to make sure I don't make any mistakes, the slate that we're moving forward <clears throat> would be Chris Shaw moving up to chair. Uh, Bart Hill moving to vice chair, Jackie Murphy moving to secretary treasurer, uh, Michael Bissonette staying as the at large for towns under 5,000, Elaine Haney being the representative for towns over 5,000, and Catherine McMains being the immediate past chair. And I want to thank all those folks for agreeing and volunteering to take those positions. And sad to say, we have to say goodbye to you on the executive committee. It's about time, right? <laughs> all, all good things. Um, and just this is a information item. Obviously, it would be an action item at your next meeting at the uh, June annual meeting. And at that meeting, Charlie, anyone who wants to make a motion from the floor will be welcome to do so. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Yeah, if somebody else wants to run for a position, they're more than welcome to, you know, to uh, do so. So we Except could bring it back respect. on, Mike. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, yes, you could. <laughs> you, you could vote to bring him back. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. You, you, any, any position but yours. Because <laughs> if you don't, then it looks like Andy will have to go in because I'll refuse. <laughs> That's right. Andy was a our, our regular fill-in for uh, immediate past chair for quite some time. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, looking forward to seeing uh, everyone at the uh, annual meeting to uh, vote on these things. Um, next, uh, agenda item 13 is the equity update. Yeah, so uh, Ann Nelson's out of town, so I'll give you a very brief update. Um, they, uh, and Nelson is continuing to you know, work on relationships around the county, um, has also been uh, connecting with individual municipalities to find out what's happening in terms of equity work or not uh, in different municipalities. Um, so if you have somebody that you wanted to talk to, please you know, get in touch with her or let me know. Uh, happy to forward along that. Um, and then in terms of more substantive work, um, we're uh, kind of starting to dig into um, some sort of equity statement and code of conduct. Uh, I'm, at this point, I'm expecting a draft to get to you for your July meeting. Um, so heads up on that. Um, and then the other a big substantive issue is um, in the work program that you just approved is $100,000 for building capacity within marginalized communities. Um, and we're trying to kind of flesh out the details of that and work with uh, the community and the uh, equity advisory committee about how that funding will flow out to community groups to uh, help them build capacity within their within their communities. So happy to take any questions on those, but that's a quick summary of what's happening on the equity front. And Ann Nelson would probably have done a better job of giving you a lot more detail, but that's uh, at least a, a sense of what's happening. Yeah, any questions? Charlie, where would the hundred thousand? Is this a matching grant of some sort, and uh, is it from the state or the federal? 
Um, it's it's MPO funding, it's federal highway funding. Um, and so um, the notion is we as we looked at what federal highway is kind of has in their equity plan and what they're encouraging, you know, states and MPOs to do is to you know build relationships with marginalized communities within your region or state. Um, and so that's what we're really kind of following through on that and trying to figure out how to um, get those funds. My best guess right now is that um, they may be getting invested in like a community liaison. So let's say it's a Nepalese community. Um, you know, it may um, help fund somebody there that um, will gather that community and kind of um, bolster their efforts to build their community so that when we have a project, let's say, um, well, one that we know is coming is the Winooski Bridge, right? Um, and it's very likely VTrans is going to ask us to, hey, can you do some outreach? Um, and if we've already invested in that community, we can contact that liaison and say, hey, can you give us some perspective from the Nepalese community? Um, so that's kind of the idea there. Thank you. Great. For what it's worth, Charlie, too, we have an, uh, the Equity Advisory Committee has an in person meeting at Oak Ledge, I think it is. That's right. Next week, or I forget the date. Two weeks. May something. Two weeks. Yeah, May 31st. Yeah. Yeah. And this will be a, a big topic of discussion is kind of trying to flush this out a little bit more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's terrific. Uh, <clears throat> Might as well um, just continue then with the executive director's updates. Yeah, just a, a few items. Um, first, thank you um, that you guys went really quick with the work program budget and the MTP, um, but it was a lot of staff work. Uh, it felt anticlimactic, uh, but, uh, but thank you for approving those. That was a lot of work leading up to those. Um, <laughs> you guys went so fast. Eleni was like, did they approve the MTP? Uh, sorry. So sorry, thank, you, I, I, thank you, staff, for all your work on that. And if you want, uh, Charlie, we can, go, we can go back if you want. We're good. Quick. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not, not asking more questions than I want answers to. Um, but uh, Bart. You know, I appreciate, as you say, that it's really true. People spend hundreds of hours on this thing and we go, <laughs> yep, bing, bang, boom, done. So yeah. I well, apologize if it feels like truncated. No, 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 thank you. It is credit to the staff for all the time and effort they put it, they put in producing a uh, high quality document documents. Yeah, and sorry. also trust in staff. Yeah, and I apologize that that wasn't me fishing for compliments, but thank you. And um, but um, yeah, and it and it is true. It is, uh, but it was just sorry, a little humorous to me. Um, <laughs> so. Um, uh, but in terms of my updates, um, we are in the process of hiring a planner uh, more on the land use side right now. Uh, we finished first round of interviews this week. Um, I think I may have mentioned it last week or last meeting, but we did get 15 uh, pretty good applicants, which was uh, actually a pretty good result in this job market. Um, so we were pretty pleased with that. And uh, we got three of them that we're bringing back for a second interview in the next couple of weeks. Um, so uh, that's progress. Um, and then the other big thing, uh, obviously the legislature has adjourned um, or at least temporarily. We'll see if they have to come back for a veto session, um, which seems fairly likely. Um, but uh, two big updates within that uh, in terms of what they accomplished in impacting us. Uh, one is just financial. Um, they did approve, if you remember early on in the session, we asked for uh, support for full funding of the regional planning commissions. Um, all the RPCs did that. Um, and it really did make a difference. I think when the appropriation committees saw that all the RPC boards had weighed in to support that um, and they approved 1.5 million um, so we're now um, a little over six million. Um, it's about sixty percent of the full funding um, statewide, but uh, which is but it's great, um, and it was a, a huge step forward. So um, thank you for your support in that. It really did make a difference. Um, we'll try not to do that too often, but um, you know <laughs> it did matter. Um, and the second, uh, more of a policy issue was uh, S one hundred, the housing bill. Um, 
there's a lot in there. There's definitely some implications for municipalities and zoning. Um, but uh, if I kind of step away from the, the details of you know local control and things, um, I th I'm very hopeful that it does have a positive impact over the longer term on our housing market in Vermont. Um, it's not going to do anything in the next you know six months or year. Um, but over the longer term, uh, it seems like it should be making housing construction in the state a little easier than it has been. Um, and there's a lot of studies attached to that. Um, so that was a good, more housing, uh, hopefully. The bad is I think there were three or four studies <laughs> incorporated into that uh, involving RPCs around, um, well, the Natural Resources Board has one that we'll participate in around improving Act 250. Uh, which was a major point from VLCT, um, you know, concerned that S100 was not addressing Act 250 changes, so there will be an opportunity to address Act 250 changes. There's also a study on the state designation program, um, and related to that, because there's um, some thought that maybe our regional planning future land use maps, sorry, they'll have a good, like this, um, might be able to get used um, and be used in the future rather than a state process have more of a regional process for designating where growth is desired in each region. So um, there's a designation study that the Agency of Commerce is running and then there's also a future land use study that the RPCs are charged with. Uh, and the fourth one is a study to look at uh, delegating Act 250 responsibility to municipalities. Um, so this was particularly our urban uh, core municipalities, Burlington, Winooski, South Burlington. Uh, we're very interested in that. And so um, we're gonna be pretty involved with that. Uh, for a while, that one actually had Chittenden County RPC as being responsible for that. It turned into the state RPCs, but we'll still be very involved in all those studies. So the next six months are gonna be pretty busy giving recommendations back to the legislature about how to do some more improvements around Act 250 designations, RPC role in that. Um, so sorry, that was, that was a lot to digest there. Happy to take any questions and take a breath on that. I just uh, overwhelmed or put you to sleep, okay. Uh, you're uh, well, I see nodding, so you're awake. Um, and then the, my last um, update is really um, on the second page of the, well, I guess not the agenda, but the page after the agenda. Um, just to note, the annual meeting is at the McQuam Barn and Winery in Milton on June 21st. Um, Emma has, I hope, gotten you save the dates. Uh, hopefully you've seen those communications from Emma and there will be more details coming uh, to make sure you get registered for those. We are um, asking for, I think, like a $20 um, payment. And that's really just so we can get a secure firm headcount um, for dinner. And it'll be more of a, a buffet, a sit down dinner. Um, and a couple of things in terms of programming there. Uh, Keisha Ram Hinsdale, Senator. Keisha Ram Hinsdale is going to be the guest speaker to really uh, talk more about S100, uh, that housing bill. And secondly, uh, we want to spend a little time celebrating the fact that the MPO turns 40 this year. Um, so that will be a little, uh, you know, we'll kind of have a little bit of maybe some boards and some commentary uh, about that. And we're asking the previous directors of the MPO to join us for that. Um, so, yeah, any questions for me? Uh, the, the only thing I have to say is, given that you know it is celebrating the MPO, and there are several members of the um, board as well as staff who have you know came from the original you know from the MPO prior to the the merger, because there most of them are all gone, but there are still a few left. You know, would it be worthwhile just to at least acknowledge um, those those people, the people that were on the MPO board before merger? Yeah, yeah, and and plus the staff who came from the MPO, kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, no, we can, uh, yeah, think about incorporating that somehow, sure. Yeah, because most people have moved on, but there's still are some that are, you know, that are still here and, you know, kind of fun to acknowledge how many people are, have uh, continued, like Jeff, of course. <laughs> I 
All right, Garrett, sorry. Um, how do we uh, pay the $20 or whatever it is? Uh, Emma is going to, I'm sure, give you some sort of button to click on that will magically withdraw from your account. Uh, I don't uh, know. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I want one of those buttons. Yeah, yeah. careful, right? Um, hmm. No, I, I don't. I didn't see that detail, so I don't know the answer to that, Garrett. I think um, I think it may be a PayPal type situation or something. It is. Yeah, that's oh. fine. I just hadn't seen a place where we can go do it and pay it, so we can get there. Yeah, I think uh, we were just kind of waiting to get through this meeting, and I think um, she'll get the uh, more formal no notice out on that to get registrations. Yeah, thanks for excellent. Us. Ben. Thank you. Yeah, um, quick question. Uh, if there's not going to be any Zoom on this, will there? For the annual meeting? Yeah, because I'm overseas, actually, but I would uh, get up at 2 a.m. to be there. Um, at least um, hello, if we were business. not planning on that to be an option yet, be that we're kind of uh, out of our office space, et cetera. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, so I'm hopeful. Yeah, try to get a good night's sleep. All right. Okay, we will do. Thank you, then. Sorry, yeah, that's, that's commitment. Chair, yeah. That would be commitment to get up to <laughs> to do that. Uh, any other comments uh, or uh, questions for uh, Charlie? I certainly don't have any chair updates. Um, so moving, if there isn't anything else, we'll move on to the number 15 on the agenda, which is a committee and liaison activities and reports. And as usual, uh, for those who wish them, they are in your packet. Otherwise, they are available on uh, via link. Um, and so that brings us to the last thing of the meeting, Ben. I'll move adjournment. Second. All those in favor, raise your hands and say goodbye and try to stay warm tonight and protect your plants. It's going to be cold. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All the best. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Have a good and night. And pray for no more.